Hey everyone, welcome to another Healthy New Zealand podcast. And today I have a very special guest, Dr. Chris Kenobi. Dr. Kenobi is a medical doctor who specializes in macular degeneration, which I'm sure we'll get to talk about at some point. But why I really wanted to, you to hear what he has to say is because of, of his research into omega-6 vegetable oils. And we've all been told that these are heart healthy and should replace saturated fat in our diet. But today, Dr. Kenobi has another story to tell us, and I'm sure you will love this podcast and will never look at a bottle of canola oil the same way. Welcome, Dr. Kenobi. Thanks for coming along. Thank you, Susan. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you. Thank you. Would, would you like to start just by giving us a bit of your personal history and what you got, got you involved in Omega-6 research? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I believe that my background is like a lot of the people that ended up in this nutrition space. I got here out of my own suffering. And my suffering really began a long time ago, uh, you know, about 26 years ago with arthritis. And I suffered with arthritis really progressive and became very severe in my late 40s. And I'm a physician. I graduated from medical school in 1990 and then, you know, specialized in ophthalmology. And, uh, but anyway, I began to suffer with arthritis about 1993 or 94, and it progressively worsened until 2011. And I'd seen, I estimate about a dozen different physician colleagues, family medicine, internal medicine, orthopedic surgeons, even two rheumatologists. And I was eventually given a prescription for uh, um, an, an immunosuppressant drug, which I took for one day. And it was, it was unbelievable timing, but the very next day I heard about the paleo diet for the first time. And I started investigating this a little bit. And, um, you know, my antennae kind of went straight up when I started understanding that it was anti-inflammatory. And by the way, I, I'm not a paleo advocate. I'm, a, I'm an advocate of ancestral diets. And we can get into what that means, but I'm no longer paleo. I'm just saying this is how I got my start. But anyway, so I eliminated grains and dairy was I thought the main things I did, and it's much more complicated than that. But essentially I did that. And with some changes in my diet uh, that go deeper than that, in 10 days, my arthritis was 80% better. And I hadn't felt that good. I couldn't feel that good even with three different drugs on board, you know, like aspirin and ibuprofen and and uh, Celebrex, those kinds of drugs, I was 80% better in literally in about eight to 10 days. And honestly, this was such a dramatic change for me, an improvement in the way I felt and my health and all of that, that I honestly, rather quickly, I, I was so stunned that I wanted to begin to learn about nutrition and the more I began to learn the more uh, um, excited I became, the more interested I became, and I started to understand how powerful diet is, both in terms of uh, you know, suffering and disease, or at the other spectrum, your health and longevity and how you feel, um, all of those things. And so anyway, that was 2011. And um, I just went, I just basically, you sort of became obsessed. And eventually in 2013, after reading the research of Weston A. Price, and I can talk about him if you want me to, but I began to understand that man-made processed nutrient deficient foods are driving virtually all of this chronic, degenerative and metabolic disease. And what I mean by that is 
heart disease, hypertension, stroke, cancers, type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, overweight, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. And then if, I understood all of that in 2013. And in late 2013, it finally hit me after studying this for three years. And I, I thought to myself, could, you know, now that I know that processed, you know, man-made processed foods are nutrient deficient and toxic, that, you know, and they're driving all this chronic disease, could they also be causing age-related macular degeneration, AMD, which is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness in people over the age of 65, could those foods be driving this disease. And so I began to investigate that uh, for the next approximately year and a half. And in early 2015, I was so convinced that that hypothesis about macular degeneration held water that I left practice and began to pursue this full time. And I, you know, ended up, we, we pub, I, led a group, we published a paper about macular degeneration. I wrote a book, started a nonprofit foundation in this regard for, you know, to try to help prevent macular degeneration and prevent progression once you have it. And so, you know, that was in, I went public with this in 2016. It's been just about four years ago. And, and then Susan, really what happened was is as I, as I dug into the research, um, I, I, became, I became even more deeply interested in vegetable oils, seed oils. And, and maybe over the last couple of years, um, the, the theoretical research that I did led me to where I felt like I needed to go public with that as well. And that's what I've done. And, and that's why people like yourself have, you know, have seen me and take notice because I have presented, presented that evidence at a couple of big meetings. And my goal is just to reach people with this, um, you know, healthy, life-saving, you know, disease pre uh, preventing message and honestly, I, I can tell people that this is so easy. The science is hard, but the application is fantastically simple and easy to implement. And you can eat all you want, I think, pretty much, and and um, you know, just make some some very fundamental, easy changes to your diet and prevent a whole lot of disease and get leaner and healthier. And um, so that's why I do this. I, I run a, a nonprofit foundation called Cure AMD Foundation. And um, I have elected not to accept compensation for any of my roles, for anything I do, for my book or anything else. I am in this to help people, period, because um, I've seen what it did, what it's done for me and for those around me. And I really just am in a position in my life where I want to spread this message. Wow, that is absolutely, um, absolutely fantastic. Um, it's the same kind of message that, you know, a health in New Zealand is trying to spread. We're trying to get these messages out to people. And we will link to, I've got a couple of your talks that you've done that um, we've already linked to on our website for people to be able to have a look at. So fabulous introduction. I do want to get into all the omega-6 oils, but I think you touched on some really, really important things there, and that's how many chronic diseases are related to what we eat. And one of the struggles I find is how do we talk to and connect people to making these changes in their diet? Lots of people say they would rather take their medication than make changes in, in their diet. And lots of people just don't think it really matters. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I actually have a lot of thoughts about that. I, I'm, number one is, is that if, if you, you know, feel like you're, you're doing okay, you're healthy, maybe you're not overweight, uh, maybe you are and you've been frustrated, um, 
but maybe you don't have any serious conditions, struggles, or you know, you don't have cancer or 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 heart disease that you know of. But you know, many people are in that boat. And what happens is is that one day they think they're fine and the next day they find out they've got cancer um, or they have a massive heart attack. And, you know, for example, with, you know, people that have um, heart disease, 25% of the time, their first symptom is sudden death. Now that's a terrible symptom to have for your first symptom of heart disease. And, you, you, uh, you know, I mean, I lost my sister to cancer two years ago, but she got uh, breast cancer back in 2006, long before I knew anything about this. And, you know, she had followed a pretty standard American diet, which is just awful. Um, you know, we are, we, the United States exemplifies the worst possible diet pretty much on the planet, at least as far as developed nations go, but probably almost all nations. Um, and, you know, I have a sister-in-law that developed cancer here, uh, breast cancer, two years ago. Uh, dreadful situation. Um, and, you know, I could go on and on, just in my own family. But my, the point is, is that you have to, it's like a heart attack or a stroke or cancer. We cannot fix these problems once you have them. There's really not very good treatment for any of these things, including cancers. Um, but prevention is key. And you prevent these disorders, these diseases, these conditions through an ancestral diet, through, which means nutrient-dense foods and lack of toxic foods. And let me put this in a, in a nutshell. You know, processed food is really made up of four things. It's refined wheat flour, added sugars, polyunsaturated vegetable oils, and trans fats. And you put those four things together and you can make, in the United States, 600,000 different food items. And these foods are nutrient deficient, meaning they don't have hardly any uh, vitamins or minerals. Um, and then there's the whole toxic uh, side of this. And so, um, you know, you, you put those together and you have created the perfect recipe for metabolic disaster. And if I eat that diet, maybe I get arthritis and then I have a heart attack. And maybe if some of you eat that diet, maybe you get cancer or have a stroke. Um, so we all react differently to the same, uh, you know, westernized diet, these same processed foods, we all have um, genetic susceptibilities, but genes don't drive this, all this disease. Genes load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. And that environment is 99 plus percent your diet, in my opinion. I hope that's a helps to summarize what you were looking for, Susan. But yeah, you tell me that, where, where, where I'm missing from. That's a fabulous summary. And I think the only other point I'd like you to elaborate on is how long does it take for this to happen? Because we eat this diet for 20 or 30 years and we don't think anything's going wrong. You know, what's the time frame for these diseases to um, sort of evolve and present themselves? That is a fabulous question, and I'm glad you, you, you asked that. So here's the thing. In most westernized nations, uh, the bulk, I think, oh, I don't have data on this, but in, in essence, I mean, we're born one day, and we begin to very soon, if not immediately, begin to consume processed foods. And those processed foods look like, for example, formula which Sally Fallon Morell of the Weston A. Price Foundation tells us is the most you know, processed, nutrient deficient, dangerous food on the planet. We begin to, we feed our kids this right away. Now, so in terms of getting sick and based on the type of disorder that you will get, it depends uh, 
dramatically on what disorder. So when, if you are consuming lots of vegetable oils and sugar, you know, processed foods, like, like baby food, you know, I mean, infant formula, for example, and then, the, and then the, and then the infant who becomes the child is now consuming a typical westernized diet with a bunch of seed oils and, you know, packaged, processed, man-made foods. Okay, they become nutrient deficient and all this toxicity begins to build up. Now, disorders like metabolic syndrome, where you begin to have, you begin to generally, you're gaining visceral fat, you're becoming insulin resistant. Um, maybe your blood sugars are already starting to go up. Um, you, you know, you're gaining weight overall, your liver's getting sick. All those things can happen in a matter of days, weeks, easily within months. Um, so those disorders happen very rapidly. So I, I mean, I saw, for example, there was, um, there was a published paper on a child that was four years old, had metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes in Canada, I believe it was. And another reports of a three-year-old, whereas like when I was in medical school in the eighties, type two diabetes was reserved for people that were adults, right, Susan? I mean, that's the way it has been. Um, so now, um, so cancer actually can hit very quickly. I mean, it's hitting children, obviously, you know, very, very young ages with these kinds of diets. Um, and then, but, and then a lot of these diseases, like for example, heart disease, uh, strokes, uh, age-related macular degeneration, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, most of these diseases have an incubation period, we call it, um, of decades. And so if a, if a, if a, baby is born, begins to consume processed foods, and then continues that into childhood and adulthood. Maybe he's 40 or 50 or 60 years old before he has the big heart attack, right? And that's the incubation period for these, for a lot of these chronic diseases. It takes a long time to get there. And this is exactly the way age-related macular degeneration is. And Alzheimer's is even longer, typically. But the, but, you know, so it depends. You know, it all depends on how much processed food you're getting, um, you know, a little bit about your lifestyle, and then which disease that you eventually get uh, will depend on how long you consume that, essentially. But let's face it, the, the, uh, it's, today, chronic disease in the United States affects 48% of adults um, so literally half of the country has a chronic uh, degenerative or metabolic disease condition. Um, and I think if you, and, and then there's another, I think it's 28% have multiple chronic conditions. Like they have known heart disease, um, uh, obesity, uh, um, type two diabetes, things like that. They're dealing with multiple of these diseases. Uh, um, so, uh, but again, what's really, really important to understand is that if you look at all of the people consuming native traditional diets, and there's a number of these studies that have been extraordinarily well done. Weston Price did this in the 1930s with populations all over the world five continents, hundreds of tribes and villages. And there's been, you know, more recent um, studies of populations like the Maasai in Kenya and Tanzania, um, the uh, Tokelauans, the um, population of Tukacinta, Papua New Guinea, um, the uh, Chamane of Bolivia. These are populations that are still consuming native traditional diets. And what I want to tell you, tell the audience is that they don't get any of these diseases. They've been proven not to, they don't get heart disease. They're not getting cancers. They're not getting strokes. They're not getting metabolic syndrome. They have no obesity, uh, virtually almost no overweight. They are fantastically healthy populations. And there's more of them than what I just listed. But what do they not have? And what they don't have in their diets is processed foods. They don't have uh, refined wheat flour, sugars, trans fats, and they certainly do not have 
vegetable oils, none of these populations would have ever had that. And I can talk about the history of vegetable oils if you want me to, Susan, but um, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Just look at the populations that are fabulously healthy. And these are the things that you see all over the world that they don't have in their diet. And I think that's such an interesting point because um, Western A. Price, um, New Zealand Maori were one of the um, groups that he investigated, weren't they? And, yes. you know, and we're seeing them so, and Pacific Islanders as well, so overrepresented in our health statistics since they started consuming this, this Western diet that you've just described. Um, and it's not really it's not really their fault because our government prescribes it our gps prescribe it our dietitians prescribe it and people say i'm eating healthy and you know there's a lot of work to do to explain to people that that is not actually healthy right and there's no reason i mean there's it's no wonder that people are so confused because uh, e even if they listen to the, the, what Sally Fallon calls the diet dictocrats, um, like from the Harvard School of Public Health and Tufts University uh, Nutrition Department and Mayo Clinic Nutrition Department, um, those organizations recommend these vegetable oils and they, uh, they recommend them for one reason only, and it's the fact that they they make the total cholesterol and the LDL cholesterol go down. Um, but, you know, I, uh, I don't have this, um, I don't have uh, an actual reference for this, but I know Nina Teicholz has talked about the fact that these organizations, some of them are being heavily funded by big food manufacturers and even by vegetable oil manufacturers. And she talked about this um, even for Harvard University School of Public Health. And so they're conflicted because they're being funded to you know, produce studies that show that vegetable oils, for example, are healthy. And why are they healthy? And what they're gonna tell you is, is they drive your LDL cholesterol down. And that is indeed true. And that is not favorable, um, which we can get into that too, but that's not beneficial, mm. in my opinion, for anyone. Great, all right. Well, we've got quite a few things there to unpack and delve into a little bit deeper. So maybe if we do start with perhaps a brief overview of the history of vegetable oils and how they are such a recent component of um, human diets might be a good place to start. Right. So, so let me start with this, Susan. First, I think the audience needs to know, um, and they can watch uh, my presentation at Low Carb Denver, which I know you're going to link to, and I did one last summer at the Ancestral Health Symposium, which you can yeah, get to on YouTube. But, um, but let me just say very briefly that in the 19th century, between 1800 and about 1900 or 1920 or so, heart disease was an extraordinary medical rarity. For example, there was eight uh, published papers on heart disease in the 19th century. Um, uh, even uh, angina, Sir William Osler reviewed angina, the chest pain that's associated with heart disease, and in 1897, he published a paper reviewing his previous 21 years of hospital experience. And he noted maybe a half a dozen cases of angina, chest pain. He'd never witnessed or heard of a heart attack ever in, in 1897. But in, by 1910, 13 years later, he had witnessed 208 additional cases of angina, chest pain, still had not seen a heart attack. James Herrick in the United States published the first known case of heart attack in 1912. So physicians in the United States, although a very few of them were aware of what a heart attack was, virtually no one had seen one in 1910, for example. But by the 1930s, 
heart attack um, or coronary heart disease was the leading cause of death in the United States. Um, and then, so it, and it continued to increase. And so today it's 32.1%, I believe, of people die of coronary artery related heart disease. In the United States, it's virtually one out of three. If you look at cancer, for example, we have data from published papers. Uh, like, for example, in the town of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, United States, in 1811, uh, cancer took one of 188 people. By 1900, cancer took the lives of one in 17. Today, it's 31.2% as of 2010, I believe it was. So again, it's almost one in three. Type 2 diabetes, for example, um, uh, absolute medical rarity in the 19th century. By 1935, we're rising to 0.37%. That was our first study. It progressively increased to, I think, 9.4% type 2 diabetes in the United States by 2015 and still climbing. But the increase between 1935 and 2015 was 25-fold increase in type 2 diabetes. How about obesity? So these prisoner studies from uh, the, from the United States, uh, the, the states of uh, Nebra uh, Nebraska and Texas, they analyzed, they took the weight and height of men age 18 to 80 in the 19th century. And there was a researcher that put this all together and he, so you could establish the, the BMI, the, the, the body mass index, and it was, so obesity was 1.2% in the 19th century in the United States. Um, but, you know, in the U.S., we thought we were fantastically lean in 1960. But in 1960, obesity was already 13%. It had risen 11-fold in 60 years. And so it continued to climb, 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 you know, all the way to 2015 is the latest data that I'm aware of. We're at 39.8%. We're at roughly 40% obesity. And the latest study that came out just a few weeks ago showed we're on target to be 50% obesity, meaning a BMI over 30 in the United States by 2030. So we're 10 years away from half of the population being obese. And then I don't know how many would be, you know, collectively obese and overweight. Um, but, you know, in 2015, I think it was 68 or 69 close to 70% of Americans are either obese or significantly overweight. All right, so let's go back. Let's talk about you know, processed foods. So sugar is a man-made processed food and it was, the consumption was extremely low in the 19th century. Um, so we know that uh, Stefan Guianet did put together this research, public, good published research. So from 1822 to 1999, sugar in the United States went up 17 fold. It went from six pounds per person per year to 108 pounds per person per year. Right. So sugar is a nutrient deficient food, right? I mean, that's just part of the problem. Yeah. Okay, the fructose part of it, if you consume enough, becomes toxic. Okay, the next processed food, vegetable oils. So for 99.8% of the world, nobody in the world had ever seen a polyunsaturated vegetable oil in the world until after the American Civil War ended in 1865. So um, 1866, manufacturers had tested cottonseed oil, which they had fed to cattle, and it didn't kill the cattle, so they started putting it in the food supply. But they didn't let people know. They started adulterating our lard and then our butter. They were putting it in there up to 40%, Susan, and people didn't know it, but they started noticing something was wrong. And then we started sending it to Europe and the, the French made complaint, for example, in 1880, that we were, you know, we were adulterating our um, um, olive oil and our lard, I believe it was both, if I remember right. But um, anyway, we were adulterating that with uh, cottonseed oil uh, by 1880. But anyway, so um, by, you know, by uh, 1909, soybean oil was introduced. 
and then we got all the others. And all these dangerous oils collectively, these polyunsaturated oils, Susan, I always try to name these. They are, um, they are soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, and rice bran. Those are the main ones, and those account for 99% or more of our polyunsaturated oil consumption that's really dangerous. And what happened was is that these oils began to replace and supplant butter, lard, and beef towel, the animal fats that kept us so healthy for thousands of years. And so if you look at 1900 in the US, 99% of the added fats, and this is all published, everything I'm telling you is published evidence, published data. 1900, 99% of the added fats in the American diet were animal fats, lard, butter, and beef tallow. By 2005, 86% of the added fats came from vegetable oils, 86%. So the vegetable oils, in terms of added fats, almost completely supplanted and replaced animal fats in terms of our added fats. And this became, in the United States, our data that we published in 2010 32.5% of the American diet came from these vegetable oils. 32, uh, basically a third of the diet yeah. is these oils. All right, so then we get, uh, you know, we in 1880, we get refined white wheat flour because of what's called roller mill technology. Well, refined wheat flour is a nutrient deficient food. Wheat is 20% of the world's diet today in the United States. 85.3% of that is refined, meaning it's nutrient deficient. So that works out to be 17% of the diet right there is a nutrient deficient food just from wheat. The final thing in terms of processed food really is, is you know, to get to finish the big picture is it's trans fats. And we, those came initially from Procter and Gamble was the company that introduced these. They're hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, which they, they fabricated out of cottonseed oil initially to, to look like lard. And that became, that was another way that they introduced these into the food supply and to compete with lard and butter. And so that was another way that you know, those, those foods began to supplant our, uh, you know, our good, healthy animal fats. So that's kind of the big picture. So by 2009, in the United States, if you look at refined wheat flour, sugars, vegetable oils, and trans fats, um, that right there is 63% of the American diet. And if you add in alcohol, it's another 4 to 7%. Um, and uh, if so total, we're at around 70 to 75 percent uh, of the American diet is made up of uh, ultra processed foods. And again, these don't have they don't have nutrients. For example, butter from pasture, pastured butter, which comes from cows grazing on grass is a great source of fat. It's a great source of nutrients. It's got vitamins A, D, and K2 to some degree. No, it's not the greatest source of vitamins A and D, but all of the vegetable oils, for example, all of them don't have any vitamins at all except for vitamin E and vitamin K1, but they don't have vitamins A, D, or K2, none of them, even the healthy ones, which I would characterize as like, for example, Coconut oil, very healthy oil, almost, you know, it's 91 to 94 and a half percent saturated. It's fantastic. It's got a long track record of health and success with every population that has consumed it, as far as I know. But it, even that has no uh, fat soluble vitamins, A, D, and K2, which you would get in pastured butter and pastured eggs, for example. So we've replaced all these really nutrient defense nutrient dense foods like pastured butter, pastured uh, eggs, um, you know, organ meats like liver and other organs, uh, fish eggs, you know, fish roe. We've replaced all of these nutrient dense, fantastically healthy foods primarily with vegetable oils 
and we haven't even gotten into the toxicity. That's just the nutrient deficiency. But that's kind of the big picture of what, what really happened and you know what we see in every population all around the world, wherever these foods go, as Weston Price showed in the 1930s and 1940s, wherever these foods go, what, what follows is, is disaster to the health. It begins with uh, you know, abnormal dentition in our children, crooked teeth, narrowed faces, cavities, um, abscess teeth in adults, followed by arthritis, like I had, cancers, and then you know we've had just thousands and thousands of studies that collectively show that you, know, you, you put these foods together and you'll drive all of this chronic uh, degenerative and metabolic disease. All of these chronic degenerative diseases follow processed foods. It's that simple. That's, that's a, quite an incredible story. There's a couple of things in there I just want to expand on just briefly. Um, people will say in New Zealand, I'm not sure what the States is like, that we, that we don't have trans fats in our food, but I have heard you talk about trans fats being in these poofer oils. Is that correct? Did I understand that correctly? That is absolutely correct. Uh, in the, the, the United States, I think, has, they, they put, they banned trans fats supposedly and they're supposed to be out of our food supply. Number one, they're not. But more, more importantly, even if they got them out of all of the processed foods and all of them had 0.0, .0 grams of trans fats, here's something that is a massive oversight is that the, and this is proven, I'm not, I will never, if I tell you anything that doesn't come from, from scientifically uh, published data, I will tell you, but the studies show um, and there's several of these that uh, have looked at a number of different vegetable oils and the um, trans fats range in these oils from 0% in some of them, that would be a really, you know, relatively good vegetable oil, up to 4.6%, I believe it was, um, trans fats, averaged 1.1% trans fats in these oils. So if you take a, an average American consuming 80 grams a day, take 1.1% of that, it works out to be about 0.8 grams, I think, roughly, of trans fats. So this Every is what, day. Mm. yeah, and, and, and the, the, the US FDA has not established that there's any level of trans fats that are okay. I mean, they're all dangerous, they're, they're, they're kind of, you know, uh, from a chemical standpoint, they're kind of like a, a wax or a plastic. And um, they're associated with many different chronic diseases. But the point to, you know, to get to the answer is, is that if you are consuming vegetable oils, you are consuming trans fats or it would be extraordinarily unlikely if you could get one that was zero grams uh, of trans fat. And that alone is, I mean, that, that's yet another of the many, many problems where vegetable oils are associated with toxicity. Mm. Thanks for clarifying that because I know people will jump in and say, oh, we don't have trans fats in New Zealand. So I think it, it's an important clarification. So, right. Can you just talk about exactly what omega-3 and omega-6 oils are? You know, they're, they're both essential. They're essential um, fatty acids that we need in our diets, but we, need, we don't need them in high quantities, do we? Can you just talk a little bit about that and, we can, and then we can get on to how, they, how the omega-6s cause damage, perhaps? Yeah, sure. So, um, so... The polyunsaturated, okay, so fats are broken down into saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat. And um, if you take a typical steak, for example, 40 some percent of that steak is going to be saturated fat. 
And another, you know, roughly uh, 50 some percent of that steak is going to be monounsaturated fat. And then the rest is going to be polyunsaturated fat. And uh, polyunsaturated fat is primarily um, omega-6 and omega-3. And just to keep with the big picture here, I won't get into the nitty gritty detail. So omega-6s, well, 80% of the omega-6 is one uh, fatty acid called linoleic acid or LA. Um, and that accounts for about 80% of the omega-6. And then you have omega-3 fatty acids and uh, the primary one of those would be alpha linolenic acid or ALA. Um, and let me just tell you that oh, these are both essential fatty acids. We have to get these in our diet. And if you eat any kind of food at all, you will get them. <laughs> it almost doesn't matter, you know, because they're in all plant sources and they're in all animals because plants make them and animals eat plants or they eat other animals. And no matter what you eat, you're going to get some almost, you're going to get some omega-6 uh, omega and you're going to get omega-3. Now, let me tell you how much we really need. So if we go back to the American diet, so we studied this and we, I calculated this, that our uh, estimated omega-6 consumption in 1865, Susan, before we had any seed oils in our diet, our omega-6 consumption I calculated is 2.2 grams. Now our omega-3 was probably about half of that, uh, something like you know a half a gram or three quarters of a gram maybe, somewhere in that range. Now what happened was is seed oils, for you know most of the seed oils range from 30 to 60 some or 70 some percent omega-6. For example, soybean oil is about 55% omega-6 linoleic acid. So before we had seed oils, we didn't have anything that would have anywhere even close to that potential consumption of omega-6. I mean, if you ate a grass-fed cow, um, you're going to get that cow would have roughly 2% of its fat would be omega-6, roughly, probably more like one and a half. So that would, you know, in, in all of its fat, that's about, that's what it would have. Whereas, you know, compare that to a seed oil like soybean oil, where you get 55% linoleic acid, omega-6. So anyway, so, so today, let me just jump forward to today in 2008, Americans are getting 29 grams of omega-6 per day, and we store these omega-6s in our fat and in our membranes and in our tissues, and they create um, a, 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 an oxidation cascade, and just basically this just lights us on fire with, you know, inflammation, oxidation, and toxicity, and we can go into that if we have any time. I know we're you know, getting close, but anyway, all, so those things together, what we do, our body is not meant to burn these omega-6s for fuel. They were meant to be stored because we were meant to get them in tiny, tiny amounts from things like, an, you know, animal meats and fats and butter and eggs, and they would all be incredibly low amounts, and we would store these, and they'd be used where they're needed, like in our mitochondria, but now we're just storing them in our fat, and they just ultimately cause disaster. They drive obesity, um, virtually, you name any chronic disease, and they have high levels of omega-6 in their fats. That's, you know, that's kind of uh, the, the, the bottom line. So we're not supposed to store these in our sort of fat cells, are we? They're, they're, they make up our cell membranes and they're involved in sort of, you know, mitochondrial function and things like that. But we're not actually supposed to store them in our fat cells. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's, that's correct. Well, I think we would store them there maybe at the same level that we would... Um, in, you know, where they're needed. I mean, you'd have a tiny little reservoir is what you you should have, supposedly, you know, the, and then you could ex pull those from your fat cells and 
put them into your mitochondria where they're needed, for example. Um, but instead, you know, I, one of the most powerful pieces of information that I, that I finally came across that I, I did talk about at Low Carb Denver was the fact that the, the population of Tukacinta, Papua New Guinea, um, it, back in the 70s, they, um, they, and they were consuming, um, their diet was almost exclusively sweet potatoes. And um, so they were consuming about, I think it was about 0.6 or 0.7% omega-6 linoleic acid. And in their fat, um, it was, uh, their, their fat was 3.8% linoleic acid. Um, and compare that to Americans in 1959 was 9.1%. And by 2008, we were at 21 and a half percent omega-6 linoleic acid in our fat stores, in our adipose fat, you know, on our bodies, 21 and a half percent compared to, um, you know, the population uh, in uh, Tukacinta, I believe it was. And we're not able to burn these fats for fuel, are we? It's a good question. I mean, I, 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 I believe that we can burn them for fuel, but because we weren't, we weren't designed to. No, I think we were, we were designed for them to be um, signaling molecules and to play this structural role in our mitochondria where they're so critical to the health of the mitochondria. But the, but the incredible thing is that if, when you eat a lot of, um, omega-6 linoleic acid, the, it destroys the linoleic acid in your mitochondria where it's needed. And so, for example, these studies that show people, you know, these animals that consumed a high omega-6 diet, the, the omega-6 in their mitochondria in this uh, molecule called cardio, cardiolipin, um, it dropped to, I believe it was one uh, it was either one fifth or one tenth of what it was in the low omega six diet. But anyway, it's so this is devastating to the mitochondrial function, and it and it results in failure of the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, where's where which is where ninety percent of our energy is produced. Mm -hmm. And so when that happens, you have mitochondrial uh, dysfunction, mitochondrial failure energy failure. And then when you get energy failure, cells start falling apart. And when that happens, I mean, the, the first thing that happens, they get insulin resistant. They start spewing out reactive oxygen species, which drives this whole oxidation cascade. Um, the energy failure results in mutations in the DNA, which leads to cancers. And the cells begin to undergo apoptosis, cell death. And that leads to diseases like macular degeneration and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And the energy failure leads to congestive heart failure. I, I mean, it's just everywhere you look, mm, yeah. it's a disaster. It's just, you, you just see widespread disaster coming from these seed oils. Would you be able to just touch on, if we've got a couple more minutes, I really would like just if you could just give us a brief explanation of what we mean when you talk about inflammation and oxidation. We bandy these terms around, but I just wonder how much people really understand what they mean. Sure. So, you know, let me just say, uh, in the interest of time, keep it really short and quick, is inflammation primarily comes from the end products of omega-6. So when you consume linoleic acid, the 18 carbon omega-6 that we talked about, it's converted to arachidonic acid, which is a 20 carbon molecule. And out of that, for example, you get inflammatory mediators. And these are things like uh, inflammatory eicosanoids, uh, inflammatory leukotrienes, um, uh, uh, and uh, thromboxanes, for example. Um, so uh, what am I leaving out? Prostaglandins inflammatory prostaglandins. So you put those together and you've got inflammation and thromboxanes also drive 
uh, clot formation. So you put these together and you've got the recipe for inflammation and even clot formation. And that's how omega-6s are driving so much inflammation uh, and uh, even things like, you know, part, that's part of the reason they're, you know, in, in, inducing heart attacks and strokes. Um, oxidation it is driven by uh, primarily, I mean, in terms of what you can alter, it's driven primarily by omega-6 because the omega-6s, like linoleic acid, it's converted to lipid hydroperoxides initially when it comes into contact with the hydroxyl radical. And we produce like 20 trillion of those a day in a normal body. But anyway, so those lipid hydroperoxides then are an unstable molecule and they degenerate into all of these toxic aldehydes like 4-hydroxynonanol, uh, malondialdehyde, carboxyethyl pyrrole, 9 and 13 hode, uh, and acrolene. And these collectively, Susan, are just so I said it, they're genotoxic, uh, they're cytotoxic, genotoxic, mutagenic, carcinogenic, atherogenic, meaning atherosclerosis producing, thrombogenic, meaning clot producing, and obesogenic, meaning they're producing obesity. Just these molecules alone, which are dangerous, toxic breakdown products of omega-6, are driving all of this disease through. That's the talk, you know, that's another big part of the, you know, the toxicity that I'm talking about, driven by omega-6 rich vegetable oils. Fantastic, thank you. Um, just to finish up, I usually like to just have a brief chat about what we should be feeding our kids. You touched earlier on the consequences of having, you know, these high processed food diets, you know, the seed oils, the sugars, the pofas, the trans fats. What do you recommend for our kids? We've got really rapidly increasing obesity obesity and diabetes in children under 15 in New Zealand. And it's a huge concern. What would right. you tell parents? So, yeah, I, I, and I, I want to, um, full disclosure here, I am not, <laughs> I don't really dig that much into uh, kids, you know, nutrition, but, um, and I, I would uh, tell your audience, I would defer enormously to the Weston A. Price Foundation, which you can find online, Weston A. Price Foundation, and Sally Fallon Morell, uh, uh, a fabulous source of information. But if I could say this just very briefly, what I would say, number one is, is that the mother's nutrition reflects uh, enormously the nutrition that will, will be, you know, provided to the growing embryo and fetus and then also to and given to the child through you know milk mother's milk and um, that you know breast milk would be fantastically healthy if the mother is properly nourished uh, and based on all of these ancestral uh, nutrition principles so the mother needs to be avoiding all of those dangerous foods and eating a nutrient dense diet and getting you know getting things like you know, hopefully liver, fish eggs, eggs, butter, those kinds of things, or raw milk, um, all those kinds of things in the diet. And then that's what the child should be, the, the, the infant should be getting, and then the child should be tra uh, transitioned to the same foods that we're eating. You, you know, in other words, the same nutrient dense foods, that's what the uh, infant and then young child needs to be graduated to and when they grow up eating this ancestral way they won't know any difference they won't be used to they'll never be used to eating you know pop tarts or you know potato chips or whatever all this junk food that's available so but that is the way to it you know your the children raised in this way will have fantastic you know straight teeth they'll be their immune system will be strong. They will be healthy. They'll grow normally. Um, it's good for their mind, their intelligence, their character, all of these things. I mean, goes clear back to Price, Weston Price showed this in the 1930s and 1940s, but 
uh, you know, obviously the world didn't listen and medical orthodoxy never listen to that and to this day does not but that is the truth and you see it everywhere you look fantastic and we'll link to the new zealand branch of the um, western a price foundation that we have here so people will be able to go and look that up a little bit more okay. so do you have any before we just finish up do you have anything else you'd like to talk about i know age-related macular degeneration is your real thing um, I don't know if you want to make any comments about that or anything else that we might have skipped that would be important. Yeah, so let me just say a quick blurb about macular degeneration. So, um, so when, when I got into this, I mean, I, I first had, I kind of had to understand the big picture. And then, as I said, I hypothesized that, that processed foods may be driving age-related macular degeneration. And that's what our research strongly, strongly supports is that it is exactly that. Um, and, you, you know, people that want to prevent all these diseases, including macular degeneration, need to follow these principles. And it's the exact same thing for people that already have macular degeneration. Um, I could give a couple of quick examples. One, you know, one would be, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the... Um, the Japanese, for example, had 0.2% um, prevalence of macular degeneration in the, in the late 1970s, but 30 years later in 2007, their macular degeneration prevalence had elevated to 11.4%, which is a 57-fold increase. And during that time, their vegetable oil consumption averaged 9 grams a day in 1961 and elevated to 39 grams a day by 2007, which is a four and a half fold increase. Um, a similar thing happened in New Zealand, um, but it wasn't nearly as severe because the vegetable oil consumption was much lower. But in New Zealand in 1961, vegetable oil consumption off the top of my head was right around zero to one gram a day uh, on average. And, um, macular degeneration prevalence in, I think it was 1969, was 1.3%. Now, vegetable oils and processed foods were going up by that point. But anyway, it was 1.3%. And then by 2014, uh, essentially about 45 years later, macular degeneration prevalence was 10.3%. So it elevated eightfold. Now, when you, you, you know, Susan, that when you look at these scientific studies, you know, they do these massive studies and they say, well, you know, if you do this or that, you decrease your risk of a heart attack by a massive 17%. Mm -hmm. Well, an eightfold difference in macular degeneration in New Zealand is 700%. Yeah, a you know a fifty-seven fold increase in macular degeneration in Japan is five thousand six hundred percent, and I'm giving you the most conservative number there is. Mm -hmm. There's other studies that would show you know the macular degeneration mm -hmm. prevalence in Japan is higher than that, and I've got other examples, but I'll just say those are some examples, and that brings it close to home for the for the folks in New Zealand mm -hmm. that you know. Um, this one, oh, but anyway, so I don't think I mentioned, but if I, if I didn't say it, vegetable oil consumption was around 20 plus grams a day, at least in New Zealand by the early 2000s. Um, but it's not nearly, it's not nearly as severe uh, as best I can tell um, as it is in most, most of the Western countries. Uh, well, we, we have a really strong plant-based advocacy now. So I think I think that it's starting to be driven up a little bit um, mm -hmm. just through that, you know, stop eating animal products. So, which is a bit of a concern, I think. I think it's a really important point too, because, you know, as people get older, as we get older, people often stop caring so much about their nutrition. They're, they're not so focused on maintaining their weight and they just start thinking, oh, well, I'll start enjoying enjoy all these treat processed foods and also in rest homes and you know old folks homes the nutrition is appalling it's it's all processed it's all processed junk you know absolutely um and so the 
kind of quality of life really decreases, I think. So, mm. I could anyway. not agree more. All right. Well, is there anywhere where we can find you, find your work? I will put links to your website. I've got your full biography, which we will publish with this video. And we already have links to those two YouTube talks that you mentioned. So we've already got those on our website for people to be able to access them. Is there anything anywhere else? Are you on Twitter or Facebook or don't really do no i really haven't <laughs> done that susan because i really just uh i i guess i don't like social media very well mm, yeah um, but i but you know our website is it i mean the organization is cure amd foundation and we're at cureamd.org and i know you'll link to that um i do have a book that you can you can link to it from there, but the, the book, which is about macular degeneration, it's also, it's on, uh, it's a, you know, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, it's at, an, it's at many retailers online. Um, and uh, any of the proceeds from the sales of those go to support the foundation. As I said, I don't accept compensation for any of that, but the, but the, the funds, I just want to say, do help us and they will help ultimately, we hope to support much more research because um, I think we need tremendously more research to try to convince my colleagues that 200,000 ophthalmologists around the world and 300,000 optometrists, and we're going to reach them primarily through the hard science, I believe. And so we need funding to get there. So um, anyway, I just wanted people to know that, um, that, you know, this is a, this is a, a, an organization that is all about helping people um, in, with altruistic motives. There's nobody that's paid at our foundation at all. Oh, well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad you <laughs> responded to my social media contact because I couldn't find I couldn't find how to get in touch with you anywhere. So I really appreciate you um, well, actually coming back to I, me. <laughs> I do want to say it was with you know our our contact button on our website at cureamd.org wasn't working at that time, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we had to get our webmaster to dig into that and, mm. and get that fixed because, be, uh, by the way, everybody out there watching, listening, I if you email me, I will answer you. I promise. I answer all my emails and... Um, I, you know, try to help everybody I can. Sometimes I'm just, you know, re referring them to a good source for something that helps answer their question. But um, I'm in this to help people and I'm no longer practicing. So that's my goal. Oh, that's fantastic. And I think my final comment will be to people listening to this. I think this podcast would be a fantastic one to share with all their GPs and you know specialists and things like that because i think there is some such important information in here that we need to get spread out there and one of the first ports of call for people is talking to their gps and you know getting support for making these kinds of changes i think so i'd give everyone a shout out to do that Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. We've gone a little bit over time, but it was a riveting conversation. <laughs> so thank you thank very you, much. I enjoyed it. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, it's an honor for me too. Thank you so much. Thank you.